Watch this. Interfaith Sanctuary gets the go-ahead to move forward with their move out of downtown Boise. Not that it was an easy decision. It took a final seven-hour meeting for Boise City Council to give them the conditional use permit. Emphasis on conditional. A year ago, Aaron Von Ellinger was a state representative. Today, he's on trial for raping a statehouse staffer. We're getting a breakdown of what happened in court during day one. Now for our 208. Never work with kids. Those wise words once said by W.C. Fields. Well, we're forgetting all about that because, well, who doesn't like a little self-promotion? It had been in the works for more than a year, and it came down to one final night of testimony and discussion among Boise City Council members. Well, to be fair, it was one long final night after a previous week with four days full of much of the same. So the fate of Interfa Interfaith Sanctuary decided after a seven hours plus meeting and the homeless shelters move from downtown Boise to a new location on West State Street was given the green light. But it wasn't unanimous and the conditional use permit wasn't granted without conditions. Lots of them. Here's Katya Stepovic. I think we're... Well, Brian... I'm not sure East on condition five. Day five of Boise City Council hearing interface appeals started with recommendations from city staff on some new conditions for interface to abide by. One, require the applicant to increase overnight staffing. Hours of deliberation followed, with some council members thinking even the new proposed 30 conditions wouldn't limit impact. I can't get to that level of certainty that all the conditions when added on will result in a facility that's run so well that there will not be adverse impacts. Having the conditions in place creates sustainability with an organization in that when there are changeover, um, whether that is leadership, whether it's board members, whether it's you know, staff, that there are still a set of rules and conditions that are in place that people have to follow. And if they follow them to the best of their abilities, and if we continue to evolve these through our regular meetings, we're able to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to um, reduce that adverse impact. Council President Elaine Clegg proposed a motion that would change several of the city recommended conditions and implement some others, including a meeting and review after six months of operation, making family spaces separate from individual ones, limiting outdoor activity from 7 p.m. to 9 a.m., bringing any neighborhood concerns to the executive director within 24 hours, and setting the maximum occupancy limit to 205, including any overflow. As far as capacity for feeding folks, for keeping folks in programming, it seems to me that under the 205 there is space for that programming to mitigate. Above that, it doesn't appear to me that there is. I don't know from a public facilities perspective that the amount of work we're offering to undertake to ensure compliance, to basically condition land use to control people's behavior is a reasonable burden. And that for me is the burden that I think is probably most undue. The motion to approve and revise around 30 conditions passed in a 4-2 vote with the notion that the conditions will be a work in progress and could change. I'm not completely comfortable with this decision. I hope that that's clear to everyone in order for the whole city not to see adverse impact from this issue. Uh, we're going to have to come together and provide even more than what is being proposed here. Neighbors that have fought long and hard to voice their concerns were hoping for a different outcome. We were disappointed to see many council members, even those voting in favor, clearly acknowledge the likely impacts and talk about having to do this constant process of readjustment. But Interface says they will comply with every condition set forth and that many of the same conditions are already being met with current shelter practices. I'm thrilled that we get to move forward into this building and I'll take every condition and we'll make it work. I don't really think 30 conditions. I've, I've had applications that have had more conditions and it's, it's crafting conditions that work and it's everybody acting in good faith to make sure they work. So relieved, I can't even tell you. Um, yeah, just relieved. It's been a really long process and a lot at risk. 
All right, Katya, it's not as if they have movers or construction workers lined up for this weekend to get going on this project on State Street. So how long is this going to take and what's that going to mean for where they are now? Sure, and as you can imagine, there's a lot on Interfaith's checklist right now before opening up their doors on State Street. State Street. And Jeffrey Wardle, Interfaith's attorney, says it's likely that neighbors will file an appeal, and that may slow down the process, of course. So we're looking at anywhere from a year to a year and a half right now. Interfaith is on a year lease right now, but if they go over because they were granted the CUP, the owner of their current building will let them stay until their building is ready on State Street. Brian? He's gave him the slack as long as things were moving forward with this process. Exactly. All right. Yep. Thank you very much, Katya. You will learn that JV tried to resist, that she tried to make excuses. You will learn that she said she wasn't on birth control, that she hadn't shaved, that she wasn't ready, that they could get in trouble, that she didn't want to, that he was hurting her. And she told him no. He didn't stop and he didn't listen to JV. They went upstairs. Okay, uh, You're not getting any, any evidence at all that she was pulled out of the car, that she was coerced out of the car. The only evidence that you might hear is that she went willingly. So those two positions from the prosecuting attorney and the defense attorney are the basic crux of the Aaron Von Ellinger rape trial. The victim made it clear she said no to the former state representative, the accused claiming it was consensual. Von Ellinger is charged with raping a state house staffer in March of 2019, a 19-year-old at the time. The trial began today at the Ada County Courthouse, and Andrew Bartline was in the courtroom today. So I wanted to ask you a couple things about this. What stood out to you, first and foremost, with what happened today? I think the most interesting part was how the relationship started in the beginning, where the prosecutor says that Von Ellinger was seeking out Jane Doe, that he was uh, making advancements toward her, while the defendant says he just gave her his phone number on a card. She independently chose to contact him. That's the only time they started talking outside of the state house in a non-professional manner. So how that relationship started on both sides, it's interesting how they're debating it right now. Okay, so we heard uh, from the, one of the representatives from FACES, the nurse that uh, kind of did the uh, sexual assault investigation on Jane Doe. How did things end up today? Yeah, well, both sides were able to talk with her and ask her questions where, you know, the, how do I word this? The allegation is that Aaron Von Ellinger was on top of her. Right. He's a 200 pound man. He had his legs pinning her arms down and forced himself into her mouth. Um, you know, during that investigation with, with um, that nurse you said, they said there were no bruises on her arms. So they're arguing that that is evidence that maybe it didn't happen or it wasn't as forceful as they would say. So that debate going back and forth on what they exactly saw when they examined her after the alleged sexual assault in terms of her, her bruises or lack thereof. Now they said there was a bump on her head. There are no pictures of that bump on her head. The nurse also says it's hard to photograph bumps on head because heads are round. So what you're seeing with your eyes maybe won't show up on a cell phone. So the debate in hair as well. Yeah. And you know, pulling the hair apart, is the picture really going to do that justice? So that debate going back and forth on um, that testimony today, um, it, it would, went a long time. I'm not going to lie. It was a long testimony. Yeah. And the other part that came up today that there was some discussion about was whether or not we're going to see Jane Doe take the stand during these proceedings. Yeah. We haven't heard the prosecutor confirm or deny if that's going to happen. That's making the defendant very upset. Had the jury leave the room at one point to talk to the judge about it. So nothing's confirmed at this point. It's still up in the air whether we're going to hear from Jane Doe. All right. Case resumes tomorrow at 9. Correct. Data County Courthouse. Thank you very much, Andrew.
advanced opportunity we advanced opportunities prigor excuse me like in a third grade classroom we teach our students not to interrupt i was speaking and you can have your turn in a moment right, yep several moments of elevated discussions during last night's first republican state superintendent debate former state senator brandon durst there's Debbie Crutchfield, the Crutchfield that is the former president of the State Board of Education and current superintendent of public instruction, Sherry Barr, debated for an hour last night on Idaho Public Television. So those three are going to tee it up again tonight right here in this studio at six. But Joe Paris is going to join us now to break down last night's uh, event as a preview of what we can expect this evening, Joe. Yes, right at six o'clock, Brian here on our set. The candidates will be here to answer questions and debate, and we anticipate that conversations will be around different topics tonight. So if you did watch last night, you want to tune in tonight at six. But going back to last night, right before we heard that sound bite we played just a minute ago, the panel was talking about and was asked about Idaho's go on agenda, where the state has a goal of getting 60% of students to go on to post secondary education after high school. According to the State Board of Education, in 2021, Idaho saw only 37% of the state's high school seniors go on to college, part of a trend line that has been going down since 2014. So to begin questions, Mrs. Critchfield was asked, how would you assure voters that you can set priorities and see priorities through? That goal was set prior to me coming onto the board and it became a part of a conversation that, that our board has had for many years. I fundamentally believe that the failure has been in the K-12 arena. What we see is uh, students choosing other options besides the traditional college trajectory and that's okay. And what we need to do or create, we need to transform how we have the high school experience, how we provide credit um, in other ways rather than in the traditional ways and, and how we provide the relevancy. And so as we, we look to matching the, the skills, the needs, the abilities of what our students would like to do and what we're currently doing, we see a tremendous mismatch. And so it's not surprising to me at all that we've seen that, that number decline because we've needed the leadership in the K-12 arena. On to the other candidates, former state senator Brandon Durst was asked about uh, once serving as a Democrat before switching parties in recent years. Mr. Durst is now a Republican. Now he defended that switch saying last night that he was always a conservative voting Democrat. So he defended his record. Now back in January, Durst proposed a bill in the Senate Education Committee that would have given parents the right to review all documents pertaining to a child's education, among other things. Now that proposal died in committee, but right after it died in committee, it was followed by a heated exchange between Durst and two Republican senators on the committee. During last night's debate, Durst was asked if he would be able to work with lawmakers who either don't agree with him or don't agree with his ideas. Well, we're hopeful that those two senators will find a different place to work next year and they won't be in the back in the Capitol building. I want to point out there was no profanity for me, by the way, but if you want somebody who's going to be milk toast and not fight, you're, I'm not your guy, but if you want somebody who's going to fight for you as a parent, then I'm just the candidate for you. But Senator, Can I respond to that, please. Uh, I was standing there, and there was profanity. I was in the Senate Education Committee that day, and there absolutely was profanity. There was by Senator by Senator uh, by my opponent. Okay, well you can say that now, but there was. I people that know me know that I don't curse, and that's fine. But the reality is that Senator Woodward and Senator Crabtree both engaged in what should be despicable behavior, but unfortunately, Senate leadership swept that under the rug. But we need a change in Senate leadership. There's no change. There's no doubt about that. The, the interactions um, were, uh, were and are unbecoming of someone that would hold that office. And I don't believe that Mr. Durst answered the question. You said, how will you overcome that? His answer was, I'm going to work to get rid of the people who don't like me. I'm going to work to get rid of the people who won't support my legislation. And then he touted legislation that he had. Can you work with lawmakers after that? Well, let's just let's look at the messenger is, Betsy. The, 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 Senate, the, Senate, the, Senate, the Senate leadership who stopped a bill this session to protect parents from pornography in their children's schools. These are the same people that are coming after me. So if you care what they think, that's great, but I really don't. Finally, incumbent Sherry Ibarra was asked about Idaho's four-year graduation rates, which slipped 2% in 2021 to just over 80%. According to National uh, Center for Education statistics, statistics, the average in the nation is 86%. 
had a pandemic, so that explains a lot. That means kids needed a little bit more time to graduate. Uh, so that's why you saw uh, the five-year graduation rate go to an all-time high. Uh, what do we need to do, though, to continue to make sure that we as Idahoans raise that graduation rate up? Well, we need career technical, more career technical education uh, uh, choices for our students and I'm proud to stay under my leadership uh, we have offered those at our seventh and eighth grade levels and for those voters watching tonight who have asked me about vocational credits in high school that's what it is it's career technical education uh, so we're now offering that at the seventh and eighth grade level we need more options within our system of public education I think one of the great things that happened during the pandemic is we realize how our kids rely so much on technology in a time when our parents will show up at the coffee shop in the morning before dropping their kids off at school and expect high-speed internet with their cup of joe, our students expect no less. And so that's another way we can keep kids engaged. All right, so get dinner started because in about 45 minutes right here on Channel 7, we'll have the three candidates on the GOP side in the primary. Four state superintendent, again, Sherry Ibarra, Debbie Critchfield, and Brendan Durst will all be here at 6 p.m. for a live debate. Brian, this is the set. The stage is set, as, as they say. It'll be interesting to see where the conversation goes tonight. Again, if you watched last night, we are anticipating to ask different questions and get different takes from the candidates. So that's what you can expect here on 7 tonight. If you're not near your television, you can, of course, stream on KTVB.com. And some of that direction could be determined by the questions presented by some of our viewers who've sent them in throughout the day. So we'll be interested to see how that plays out. Thank you Right. Yeah, the same number you sent into Brian. Send us some of your text messages for uh, debates tonight. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Joe. I went to the KTVB app and I got all of my new stuff from there. I know it sounds just like the perfect promotional script written by the KTVB marketing team, doesn't it? Except it wasn't. It's 10 year old Lydia Fletcher. She likes watching the news like a lot. And because of that, the sixth grader at Greenhurst Elementary in Nampa decided she would recreate her own news earlier this year. 
and her newscast caught her eye because, well, how could it not? Hi, welcome to the Fletcher Family News. Back in January, Lydia Fletcher was stuck at home. I guess I was just bored. I was just bored. The longest serving Idaho mayor retires, Norm Steadman. You know, Lydia, a lot of kids uh, to cure boredom likely wouldn't turn to news. I mean, most kids do like Le Lego movies or they do go outside and do, you know, TikTok stuff or whatever, but not you. No, I do the news. <laughs> <laughs> I just like it because it's like a small little community. Just a small community. Yeah, that's true, it is. We're gonna start off with COVID cases. Which is exactly how Lydia's video adventure began. We were quarantined because we had COVID. As you can see, we started down with zero cases on Monday. So basically it was telling how each member of my family got it throughout three days. It slowly climbed to two cases. Like my sister and my dad got it first, I think. But then it grew by Wednesday. And then my mom got it. And then me and my younger sister. Everyone in the family has COVID. She even included... Gary here with the seven-day forecast. A weather report. Here's the forecast. That impression of Larry Gebert with the self-made stuck-on stash is what led Lydia's mom to share the videos on social media shortly after his sudden passing. He was my favorite weather reporter. He was. I know. He's a lot of people's. So it's going to start with... And that is our seven-day forecast. Back to you. Like, how often would you say you watch the news? Like, every day. Every day? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, every morning, the first thing that turns on is the news, and then every afternoon, we watch the 208. Thanks, Larry. Now for our 208. Oh, yeah. There was even a nod to us. For our 208. Lydia, using screen time for news time, about a is just fine with her mom. They get to play on their electronics, but part of it is they have to do something creative and use it as a tool. So no other plans to do uh, to do anything else? Uh, no plans. I just make it up as I go. Now for our astronomy forecast. I guess we better come up with an astronomy forecast now. Lydia, as you just heard, doesn't necessarily have any plans to do more of these videos. She's right now just looking forward to her 11th birthday, which is coming up in July. By the way, by no means do we agree with WC Fields. We love working with kids here on the 2A. In fact, we want to hear more from kids, especially in the form of some questions. So here's what we'd like to see. Like Lydia's mom said, use those electronics for good. Record your questions you have for us on your phone like with video. Something you want to know, you want us to answer. And maybe you want to know who is W.C. Fields. Maybe that's your first question. It doesn't matter what it is. There are no dumb questions, just dumb people trying to answer them. So we'll get to those. But for now, let's check out our astronomy forecast. Bree? Well, Brian, not necessarily my specialty, astronomy, but I do know a star when I see one, and Lydia is certainly up there, so I'm looking forward to seeing much more from her and from the other kids in the area. So let's take a look at satellite and radar imagery as we still have some showers lingering, mainly in the mountain regions. I think the wettest and most active weather, we saw some thunderstorms earlier this afternoon, it's behind us. It has moved to the east, and we even have some clearing skies in store for us before the sun goes down so we will see the sun today uh, before we lose it for the day and no it's been one of those uh, days where it seemed like it was gloomy all throughout the day so debuting a new graphic I just made this up I thought this was a lot of fun dress for the next three days sunscreen and sunglasses for tomorrow as we really break out the clear skies and then I'm looking at Taylor Swift songs for Friday because that is a brown cardigan or a brown sweater as would have it coolest day of the week so you may not need it throughout the entire day but might not be a bad idea seven day forecast showing the ups and downs of spring continuing for us and as we wrap up the month of April and head into May we have more spring showers on the way and as always you can find the freshest forecast at KTVB dot com.
All right, final moment to the show here. And I, Debbie texted this message in. It's a little long, but I'm going to kind of paraphrase it here. She wanted to ask about the superintendent of schools re relating to critical race theory. Uh, I heard from some of these candidates the CRT is being taught, yet I have to yet to see an example from any textbook in any school district made public to actually show it is being taught. It was addressed last night to the candidates. Critchfield and Ibarra said it's a concern of parents, but they hadn't seen anything of it. And uh, Durst said that he says it is prevalent throughout Idaho schools. More on that tonight. Brian, let's be honest. We need an astrology forecast. Lydia's got my vote. That's a good point. Yeah, we could do that once in a while. Let everybody kind of know how that looks. W.C. Field said don't work with kids. He also said I love children as long as they're properly cooked. Yes, he did. Thanks for sending that in, Steve. We'll see you back here tomorrow.